thanks for joining us for the, the Blue Mountains Voice Town Hall. Uh, whether you're in the room today or whether you are uh, watching via the internet from wherever you are, it's great to have you along for what we think is going to be a really terrific session to give you some framework on which to make a decision when you are asked to cast your ballot for the referendum later on uh, in the year. And um, I should begin, by the way, by acknowledging the, uh, the traditional owners of the land that we meet on today. We are meeting on the lands of the Darug and Gundungurra uh, people that were uh, never ceded. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name's Robbie Buck and I am your facilitator today. And I'll oh, stop it. <laughs> it's just so nice to be in your part of the world. You live in such a, a glorious space and place here. It's, um, it's really so special. So thanks very much for having me. Um, we are going to be hearing from some really great people who have got some fantastic insights into, uh, into The Voice in a, in a little while. Um, but let's begin with Welcome to Countries first up. And I'm going to invite Uncle Colin Locke uh, first up for the first Welcome to Country. Colin. This working? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> I hate talking to a mic that doesn't work. <laughs> um, look, welcome. I'm, I'm so glad to see a good turnout here today. And I'd just love to get all your opinions throughout the hour, and I'll make my welcome very short. I'll do the abridged version, because um, I want to ask a couple of questions at the end. What are you saying to me? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you um, Look, my name's Uncle Colin Locke. I'm the sixth generation, stemming from Yarramundi, who was chief of the Baru Barongal clan at the time of colonisation, and he resided in the Richmond area. Um, Darug country stretch, stretches from Bondi to Blackheath, Palm Beach to Picton, Colo to Camden, Campbelltown, and up the Burragarang Valley. I'd like to warmly welcome you all here today and to pay our respects to the elders of the Darug Nation. Um, it's not only that, I'd like to pay my respects to your ancestors, your ancestors and the diverse places where they have journeyed from and to in their past lives. While you are here on Durham Country, may the good spirit by army watch over you from the high country and take you all safely on your journeys home at the end of every day. And I forgot to say welcome, distinguished guest. <laughs> and Mark too. <laughs> okay. Look, I was just wondering how many Aboriginal people are there here? Can you put your hands up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Yep. Okay, now I just want to know who's for the voice? <laughs> A lot of Aboriginal people. <laughs> just the Aboriginal people? Yeah. One, two, three. Four. Four and a half? Yeah. Who's against? One. Two. Three. Make up your mind. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> okay, that was all. Thank you very much and uh, I'm looking forward to discussions between everyone here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. And uh, please welcome... Auntie Sharon Halls as well for another Welcome to Country. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks. Well. Good afternoon. Um, for those who don't know who I am, I'm a Gundungra elder. Um, our ancestors came all the way up through all the rivers and streams and eventually ended up in the Blue Mountains. Some of the rivers that they were in were the one of the main rivers is 
right through the Burra Garang, down into the Wallandilly, down to Goulburn, and back up through into Janolan Caves, and a little bit out west as well. We're um, very proud people. A lot of us ended up in the missions and also very much part of the stolen generation, particularly my family. I like to welcome you here this afternoon. It's so good to see so many people turn out to listen and learn. And as we're all on a journey together, really, to understand, I suppose, the Constitution and the way the Constitution is now and also how it's going to look into the future if the changes go through. Because I think it affects everyone and we need as much information as we can really gather together. And it needs to be the right information because there is an awful lot of information out there at the moment. So I'd like to start now by paying my respects to the ancestors of this land, the Mother Earth who looks after us and our responsibilities to her going into the future. Elders past, elders present, as well as the emerging elders who will hopefully take over when we're unable to actually come and speak to people as well as we would like to, and that's called old age. Um, <laughs> and I guess old age is a good thing, um, but what comes with it is we have the foresight that we're teaching our younger people who will understand the past know where they came from and actually have a direction to go to. And hopefully the constitution changes have happened in other parts of the world um, at different times. And in Australia there's been constitutional changes. But this is the first time a constitutional change is, I guess, creating so much interest before constitutional changes was just something, a matter of fact, but now that it's involving Aboriginal people across Australia, I think that's where the big change is coming. I'm not the speaker, so I'm going to give it back to Robbie, and I'm looking forward to learning also. I've read a lot, I've spoken to a lot of people, but I think we all need to talk to each other one-on-one -on -one as well. All right, thank you very much, Sharon. And Sharon makes a very good point. By the time you, um, you leave either the auditorium, if you're here, or uh, finish up today if you're watching online, then we're hoping that you will have a, a much clearer idea of not just where we're heading as part of this referendum, but indeed what the backstory to it is. And, uh, and Rachel's going to be um, sharing a lot of that in, in just a moment. Um, you, if you're in the hall or if you're, if you're watching online, you'll notice that there is a QR code right in front of you. And I know we shudder when we see a QR code because we remember what happened in the pandemic and uh, it ruled our lives. But this is really fantastic technology that we are uh, utilising today. And it's a chance for us to bring a town hall meeting like this uh, into the digital age. And it means that you are able to have instant feedback from in here or wherever you're watching today as part of this conversation. And we ask you to do that. So if you can please, if you can do it from your seat uh, and use that QR code, I invite you to do that right now. If, you, if it doesn't work from where you are, and it may not, there are sheets of QR codes going around the place. And this will take you to the website that we are running at the moment as part of this town hall conversation. And it means that you can have your say or put your questions forward to us while we're on stage and hopefully have them answered. But it also means that we can test the mood uh, of the meeting today and get a sense of what you know at the beginning of this session and what you have discovered at the end of the session as well. So, look, when you sign on, if you can hit, there's a little love heart button there, I think if you sign on and hit the love heart button, um, that lets us know that you have entered the digital room, if you like, not just the physical room here today, and that means that you can be a part of it as we go on. So please um, check out the QR code, sign on, and be a part of the meeting via that platform if you can. A um, couple of familiar faces up on stage today, and I think it's about time that I pass it over uh, to these two who you know very well. Of course, Susan Templeman is your local federal MP, and Mark 
uh, Greenhill is your mayor. Uh, they've been, of course, very much uh, behind today's meeting. So, Susan, over to you. Thank you very much, Robbie. I told Robbie that people in the mountains would be thrilled that he was here in person, <laughs> and you didn't disappoint me. So, yeah, thank him for being part of this. Could we also thank Cassidy, the uh, beautiful guitarist and singer from Winmalee, ex Winmalee High. And, and she'll be uh, making our exit a pleasurable experience as well later. Um, thank you both Uncle Colin Locke and Annie Sharon Halls for, your, for welcoming us because really the next hour is an acknowledgement by all of us that we uh, fortunate enough to live in a country that has more than 60,000 years of an incredible culture and we're very privileged to have that and I really want to acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander individuals who've come today with all the myriad of views um, to start to take the next step in the journey of the conversation. And that is really what today is about. We have reached an incredibly important moment in history, and this year will be very telling for our country. Uh, the, a process has been laid out by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to have a greater say in decision making. Uh, it does involve a change in the constitution. This is the pocket version of the constitution, and if you've not been able to get your hands on one, we're able to help you with that. And every Australian will obviously have a chance to vote on this later in the year. So today is the opportunity to make sure we're, we're able to talk about the issues with a common language. We're going to cover four key points. What is the voice and where does it come from? How will the referendum work? What are the arguments for and against this change and how we can work together to make history? And it's wonderful to have you all here. Of course, we're going to hear from Rachel Perkins and Rachel, I personally just want to say how thrilled we are to have you in the mountains. You're also joined by many of your elected representatives, Trish Doyle, Susie Van Opdorp, Romola Hollywood, Mick Fell is hiding somewhere, there we go, not too far up there. Um, so I want to thank them for coming, but most importantly, we want to thank you all for making the effort. I'd like to have a show of hands for those who've come from the Hawkesbury. Thank you. That is a big trip. Thank you very much for being here. But there are also people from as far as Blackheath, uh, and, which is also a big trip, right? <laughs> to come down the mountains. I'm going to hand over uh, to Mayor Mark Greenhill, but we're obviously here because we're committed to ensuring that people are well equipped to determine their vote. I will certainly be voting yes, and I want to share the understanding I have, but the understanding from a range of perspectives with people. And I'm going to ask our wonderful Mayor Mark Greenhill to say a few words. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> can, can I just acknowledge that we are here today on the lands of Adarig and the Gundungurra people? Um, can I acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging? And can I extend uh, that acknowledgement um, to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander Australian who might be present here today. Um, I also want to acknowledge our, the presence of our state member, my council law colleagues, my deputy mayor, um, Council Romla Hollywood as well, um, as the other councillors have been mentioned, and the council staff. Um, and Susan, can I thank you and your staff um, for partnering, uh, for op suggesting we do this and for partnering with council and putting this event on. Thank you um, very much uh, for that. I'm grateful you said yes. <laughs> That's right. It's um, coming out of my stipend. Um, no, it's not. I hope. Um, what I wanted to do was just tell you a story that happened yesterday. It spoke to me personally about how far um, I think we as Australians have got to go. Um, yesterday, because um, I, I travel around a bit, um, and yesterday I was in Adelaide. And I was walking up across North Terrace from the River Torrens. Um, and um, there were two First Nations blokes sitting on the step, looking out over the river, having a chat, and one of them said, g'day to me. 
as I walked past and I said, g'day, back. And I walked past and I heard him say to the other fellow, oh, good on him, he said, g'day, back. And I stopped. I turned around and he saw me turn around and walk back towards him and he stood up, obviously wondering why I was coming back. And I went up to him and I said, why did you acknowledge that I responded to you saying g'day? Why did you feel a need to, to essentially note that? And he said, well, I sit here a bit and I say g'day to everyone who walks past and you'd be shocked at how few actually say g'day back. So... In that moment, I said, well, my name's Mark. Um, I'm from the Blue Mountains near Sydney, and it's a real pleasure to meet you. And he took my hands, both of them, and said, my name's John. Uh, I'm from Adelaide. It's great to meet you too. And in that second, two Australians shared a moment. What that said to me was that we have a long way to go. And the voice of First Nations people needs to be heard at all levels. And as Australians, we need to stop and we need to listen and we need to hear the voices of First Nations people. So I wondered over the last few days what I would say in my brief introduction. And yesterday, uh, John by the River Torrens in Adelaide gave me something to say. So, from John in Adelaide, g'day, <laughs> and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. And g'day to John in Adelaide too, absolutely. Uh, how did you go with the uh, access to the platform? Is everybody signed on okay? All right, so look, at this point in the, the proceedings, we want to ask you how you feel you know, well, how well you know uh, the, um, the, the setup of the voice and what it is. And you may not know anything about it. I mean, the whole reason for being here, of course, is an information session. But to use the, uh, the little tool that we've got, and if you're listening um, via the internet, then please do respond to this. We've got a question that we're going to throw up uh, on the screen. Have we got it there? Yeah. How well informed do you feel about the voice? And you've got uh, a number there to respond to, either one don't really know anything about it at all. That's why I came along, Buck, you know. Um, or uh, you strongly agree, I think I know pretty much everything. I'm actually here to tell everybody else about it. Just give me the microphone. Um, and then we will ask you at the end of the session and see whether that uh, has shifted at all. So, um, yeah, make sure you do that for us. Um, let's get into it, shall we? Rachel, thank goodness you made it here this afternoon because she... <laughs> has been on the side of a highway next to a broken down car and it has been a very difficult little time, but, but you're good. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, the, background, the background behind the voice and indeed the, uh, the Uluru statement. Now, Rachel, as you know, is a, an acclaimed uh, filmmaker and a screenwriter. She is behind the documentary The Frontier Wars, which you should see. If you haven't seen, it's available. Uh, you're also the co-chair of Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition, which is leading the Yes 23 campaign. And maybe you can give us a bit of background about what, what that campaign is as well. But you're here also to read the statement for us and to really give us that sense of gravity about what, what it's saying and why we should take notice of it. Rachel Perkins, folks. Can I add my thanks um, to the Gundungurra Nation and the Darug Nation? Thank you very much for having us in your country today. Um, I'm from the Aranda and Kalkaroon people, Valla Springs and Mount Isa region, and also have uh, Celtic and uh, Prussian ancestry um, through my mother. Um, and it's an honour to be here today with you, and thank you for coming means a lot that you're here, actually, to me. Um, I really appreciate you, you taking the time to uh, have a conversation about this very important moment that we're in right now in this country. The Uluru Statement from the Heart says, We, gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all parts of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. 
our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion the ancestral tie between the land, or Mother Nature, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise? that people possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth language, language in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution, Makarara, is the culmination of our agenda, meaning the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country, and we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. And that's what we're doing here today. Thank you very much, Rachel. And I'll get you some, um, some background about that in just a, in a moment's time. You can see in the back uh, on the screen here that we're asking you to give us a response to what you just heard um, from Rachel there. And you can write any word you'd like. Uh, and we'll get a bit of a, a word cloud going on in the background just to get a sense of how it landed for you and how you feel about that. There are a lot of words that you could choose. But um, yeah, if you want to throw that one up for us, that would be great. I guess it's a question I can ask you too. Rach, what, what's your response? Perhaps when you first read those words or first heard those words, what was your response to it? Well, I was um, a delegate to Uluru um, meeting and uh, so I was present when those words were read and um, when there was a standing ovation given. Um, it was a very moving moment. Um, but... The words don't necessarily just speak about that moment to me because they speak about my father and his friends and community, many of who are not with us anymore, who have asked for these things, demanded these things over their lifetimes and, and didn't live to see those things realised. And so for me, it's very bound up in my family, the people I've known, the movement, you know, that these aspirations have not yet been realised and, and weren't. So I, I feel like... 
you know, the history and time sort of all around me when I hear those words. Yeah. And just some of the background about how we got to that statement. So, um, I, people think that constitutional recognition has been a very recent thing. I just want to very briefly tell you um, that uh, obviously since, you know, 1770 there's been the unfinished business of the um, occupation of our countries. Um, in 1995, though, after the Mabo decision, my father and a number of other Indigenous people did a thing called the Social Justice Package, a report called Rights, Recognition and Reform, and the number of recommendations that was meant to address what Native Title couldn't address. It's called the Social Justice Package. They went around to 17 regions, talked to Indigenous people right around the country and made a number of recommendations, many recommendations. My dad put a lot of time into that report he felt like he was the articulated vision to take the country forward. One of those recommendations was for constitutional recognition and a process to take that forward. So that, you know, it, that was in 1995, that report is more recently, um, and, and unfortunately, which is why we need a voice, that report is shelved and ignored. Um, of course, we know that there's been more than a decade of research and work and committees into looking at constitutional recognition and what form it might take. So there's been the expect panel, a number of panels, a number of reports, a number of parliamentary um, committees have looked at this question. What will the form of constitutional recognition take? What will the form of that recognition be? We know that John Howard had suggested in 2007 um, that he would um, put in some words in the preamble that would give recognition. Um, but even before then, in 1999, there was a referendum on the Republic, which failed, as you know, and also in there was some, in the preamble, some suggested recognition for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I hope I haven't lost you going back and forwards with my explanation. Anyway, that was also rejected by Indigenous people at the time as well. And the reason that just words, just symbolic words, without a voice, is not something Indigenous people want is because it makes no practical difference. So, in 2017, there were 12 meetings across the country, 13 meetings across the country led by uh, Pat Anderson and Professor Megan Davis. They went to communities around the country. They asked people a number of things, what constitutional recognition means for them. So there are all sorts of conversations and all those conversations were um, reduced down to these, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So there was overwhelming support for constitutional recognition and the recognition that that support would take would be in the form of a voice. So that's essentially the hub of the first request from the Uluru Statement from the Heart, that constitutional enshrinement occur and that it take the form of the voice. And then it has two other parts to it, which is Makarata Commission, Agreement Making Commission and Truth Telling. And they're sequenced in that way for a very specific reason. So yes, it, it, it's been a long time coming more than a decade, and now we're here in this moment with a referendum to look at that question. Okay. Um, thank you very much for uh, all your responses as well. If you're watching online, then you can see how they've been unfolding. They were up there while you were talking. Were yeah, and they were, um, they were lovely responses. We'll get in a moment, Rachel. You'll take us through what the, uh, the written um, question has, uh, has well, become. But before we get to that, let's go to you, Susan, and talk about the changing of the constitution. We know that a referendum is required, but just give us a little bit of background about how that change occurs and what the process is that we're looking at. So the, the brass tacks of it are that the question will be put, you'll be, there'll be various pieces of legislation, uh, some of which is already uh, in the parliament. Uh, and, and what it's really going to be, the outcome's going to be really quite simple. You'll vote, it'll be like an election. You'll turn up at a polling booth it'll, and be given a ballot paper and be asked to say yes or no. And so in terms of that process, uh, the, unlike the numbers, I don't know if we'll have to wait 16 days for a result, as some in this room will appreciate 16 days is quite a significant number for me. <laughs> 
Uh, but it might take some time to get the results. And what we need to see is the, a majority of people in a majority of states have said yes. Uh, and the Northern Territory and the ACT don't count in that state's bit. Uh, so that is sort of the, the tin tax of it. All right, let's talk about what the, the question has become and what perhaps you'd hoped it was to be and, and what we're being asked to make that decision on, Rachel. Are we going to put, yeah, the question yeah. up? So the question has three parts, but above you see is the principle. So this is the recognition part. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first people of Australia. So that's the recognition of Indigenous people there. And then it takes the form of these three elements, that there shall be a bo body called the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander voice, um, that the voice may make representations to the parliament and executive government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, and the parliament, subject to the constitution, have powers to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. So that means that the government can design the form of the voice um, and, uh, yeah, it has that flexibility. And I think we're going to put up the actual question next. So you've got the precise wording um, because that's just a summary of it. Uh, do we have no, we don't. Okay, we don't. Okay, anyway, but it's very similar to that. Yeah, okay. Um, if you do want to ask questions uh, as part of this process as well, if you're in the room or if you're watching online, you're able to type those questions in and we'll try and pass some of them on um, to our panel this, this afternoon as well. We've, Rachel, I've got one that's just come through here which I think is uh, a good one to talk to and that is how do you envisage the voice mechanism providing equitable pathways to representation of the diverse needs of the many genuine Indigenous groups around the country. So I guess it's that question of, of how is it going to represent such a, a, a diverse country? Yeah, well, it's a good question um, because we are one of the most diverse continents in the world. Um, I think it's important to know that this question that we've just looked, like, looked at is what Australians have to decide on, right? So we have to vote yes or no on that. Um, the Parliament's job is to then write the legislation as they do with any other legislation. The Constitution just gives you this sort of overarching rule book and then the legislation is defined underneath. Now, uh, the legislation for the voice is not drafted yet, um, but there has been a very thorough report done by Professor Marcia Langton and Tom Kalmer that uh, took years to develop with a huge um, engagement process behind it and they identified certain principles that the voice might have, um, and the government has accepted some of those principles. So although we don't have the specifics of the legislation, we have the broad terms of what, how the, the shape of the voice. So it's important to know that the voice is going to be a regional voice, because as Indigenous Australia is structured, the many groups like we have here, want to speak on behalf of their issues in their communities. So it's a regional voice, it's from the ground up. We also know that the voice, it will have a Canberra, it will go up to a national voice, but importantly, the emphasis is on the regional grassroots voices. Um, the, we know that the, one of the principles is that it will be both men and women that will have equity. Um, and that it will take into consideration existing structures as well. So um, that legislation, once the voice of referendum is successful, that legislation will be developed then in close um, uh, engagement with Indigenous people to work out the, the detail, the finer detail of the voice. But I think the principles of it being regional are important and gender equity and it has an emphasis on youth as well and special allocation for remote communities as well. So that's some of the features that define it. We know that it won't have the responsibility to give out grant funding um, and uh, it won't run programs as well. So that's, in some ways, it's defined by what it doesn't do in many ways. Um, Rachel, there's also a bit of confusion around the principle of sovereignty and about the legal, legal implications of the voice as well. I know that you've been looking at some 
um, decision making or some an analy analysis in, in I recent have. Times. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> As it so happens, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just uh, something I prepared <laughs> earlier. No, I, I didn't prepare it because um, I am but a bush lawyer, um, <laughs> like many people who talk about the Constitution. Um, so, we got some advice, not we, the National Native Title Council, got some advice from the most senior Indigenous lawyer in the country, Tony McAvoy, and he's a silk, and he gave us extensive advice about the effect of sovereignty, um, because if you get onto Facebook, you'll find that people say things like it's going to undermine sovereignty. So, this is a real concern for Indigenous people, right? It's a valid concern. So we got him to give us some advice about that and I have one copy with me <laughs> um, and this copy as well. So I can read out a quote from his advice. If you yeah, it's not yeah. that long. It's not the long. It's yeah, a paragraph. Sure. Yep. Um, so he says, I mean it's a couple of pages long as advice, but he says, in my view the holding of the referendum, and he refers to other experts as well, but this is his summary. In my view, the holding of the referendum is not a claim or fact which could be interpreted as asserting either primacy of Australian sovereignty over First Nations sovereignty, nor a denial of First Nations sovereignty, nor confirmatory, confirmatory, how have you pronounced that, of cessation by First Nations. In the context of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the action of committing to the establishment of a Treaty and Truth Commission, it is more consistent with the recognition of an ongoing First Nation sovereignty. So he says it does actually the reverse. And he goes into detail about how, of course, the, the dialogues that happened, those 12 or 13 meetings across the country that drew Indigenous people together, they weren't representative of every First Nations group and the people who participated weren't there on behalf necessarily of their First Nations group. So those people you know, were a sample of Indigenous Australia. They didn't carry authority to make any agreement to, um, you know, uh, um, transfer sovereignty. So it can't. It cannot be a sovereignty transferring act because none of the Aboriginal people there did that, had the authority to do so, and neither did the Commonwealth expect them to do that. So anyway, I can get more copies of this advice, but sure. it's very clear. Yeah, and did you want to, we do have a, a legal, did you, do you want me to take your legal advisor down here as well? Well, I think only if we get more discussion around okay, it. I'll sure. ask, I've asked a lawyer to come along, John, um, <laughs> his friend of mine, because I have limited <laughs> capacity to explain these things. <laughs> well, look, it's, it's actually a good um, point just to pause and to take a look at some of the questions that are, are floating in. We do also want you to vote on, there are a number of... Uh, questions that that come to the top when we do these sorts of sessions and we might throw some of those up in a second and get you to vote for the one that you think is right at the top of your list of, of questions as well but if it's not there then as we've said please um, throw us a question if you'd like to via the uh, the platform that we've got there one um, yeah so have we got have we got oh yeah okay so let's have, have a little look at this so the most important question to you and these are not in any order really um, you vote for the one that you think is, is the one that we want to um, tackle the most. Um, will it make a, a practical difference? Do all First Nations people support it? Will it create special rights for one group of Australians? And um, my screen's gone out. Yeah. Will it unite or divide us as a nation? So look, isn't this amazing technology? It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, well look, if you've got a big voice like you, you probably don't need one. Which one are you voting for? Okay, well, let's, let's tackle... Oh. Hi there. Um, can I make a request? There's a lot of us that can't access that. Mm. So to bring in people from here, can you also do a straw vote and incorporate that? Sure thing. No worries at all. All right. Um, Let's, let's go with what we've got here. Voting for number one is the, the, the question we'd like to tackle first up. Hands up. Okay. I'm, I'm counting really fast. <laughs> I, think, I think we've got that. Okay. Second question is, will it unite You or can't divide? read it. Okay. The first question is, will it make a practical difference? That's with the one with the big blue at the top. Uh, hands for, will it unite or divide us as a nation? A few there. Um, do all First Nations people support it? A lot of hands there. And will it create special rights for one group of Australians? Um, let's 
tackle that first one, Rach, if we can, which is, will it make a practical difference? Yeah, so um, the reason the constitutional recognition takes the form it does is because we want a practical difference. If we didn't want a practical difference, you'd just have words saying Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were here, you know, and that would be the end of it. So we don't want just the symbolic. We want what's called structural change. So in our democracy, Indigenous people are about 3% of the population. So even though you might see us a lot on the news, at demos and things, <laughs> and on the football field, actually, we are a very small proportion of the population. And so our vote doesn't have a huge impact. So that the, we have, we make it, it's hard for us to have an influence on political parties. Um, and we are the only people with whom specific laws are made about. So when those laws are made about us, like heritage laws or the native title laws or other laws, it's hard for us to have an impact because we're such a small demographic. So the voice is intended to require that parliament listen to us because over so many years... Uh, policies have been made, mostly in Canberra, thousands of kilometres away from the people whose lives are going to be affected by those laws. So I'm an art under person, I come from Alice Springs. We've seen decades of laws that have had good intentions but haven't had the expertise or lived experience of Aboriginal people who those laws are made for um, giving their views on how to make those laws. So, for instance, you saw the alcohol bans lifted in Alice Springs recently. Now, if the voices were heard there of Congress, Aboriginal Congress, the Health Association, who said, don't lift them in the way that you're going to, we wouldn't have had some of that chaos. You know, we've had numerous examples of where laws have been made, like under the Northern Territory Intervention in particular, where those laws haven't been thought through about how they're going to impact people on the ground. So these laws, this, this change is about hearing from the experts in their lives about how these laws can best be designed to make improvements. And all the time we see that Indigenous people, if you're engaged in the solutions, if you're engaged in the problem solving, if you have agency, those programs are going to be you know, more effective. So, you know, our own Aboriginal health services are highly, you know, effective services in the Northern Territory. You know, I'm a filmmaker because I came through a really effective Indigenous design program to develop Indigenous capacity. You know, so when we are, when we have a role in the things that are designed to help us and improve our situation, those things are often better. So it's about having a say in our own affairs. And Robbie, I'd add as the someone who has to make those laws and pass the legislation that's there, I want to know that we have taken the very best advice. And some people have said to me, well, you've got a whole range of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander MPs now in the parliament, but of course, they are representing an entire electorate and they are a huge gift. Pat Dodson, Linda Burney, Malandiri McCarthy, Marion Scrimgeour, what they have brought to our Labor caucus has been phenomenal and deepened our understanding. But for me, the voice will in some ways assist them but also lift a burden on them for being the sole voices because we will bring people's voices together. Uh, so as a legislator, I get, I get advice from a lot of people uh, and organisations who have a lot of money and it takes a lot of effort to bring people together from around the country to uh, put a view and we sh I think we should be helping our First Nations people do that and that's for me where it will fit. Robbie, our level of government doesn't make laws but we implement the laws of, of state and federal governments. Um, for me as a mayor, and I've been the mayor of a city for a, for a decade, um, and. Um, have the privilege of being one of the longest serving, currently serving mayors in New South Wales. And I'm sure my colleagues would agree with me. 
to be able to hear about the effects of the laws that we have to implement um, on First Nations people directly from a voice would be enormously important to us. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, uh, here, here is another question that's just come through uh, online, and it says, I'm seeing a lot of disturbing negative emails coming through to say no, saying that it will create another layer of bureaucracy. How do you answer that? Um, I guess Susan and, and, and probably Rachel as well both want to answer that. Well, all, as Susan, you said, there are existing organisations that advise government um, uh, land councils, for example, in the Territory, um, you know, uh, peak organisations. The difference here is that the voice constitutionally requires them to listen and to consider. And there's never been that requirement before. So it's the moral weight of the Australian people standing behind us saying, we think Aboriginal people should be heard when laws are made about them and policies are made about them. That's the strength of the constitutional change. That's why we need you. So that's the difference. Um, and there's all sorts of bodies set up to give advice to government. There's Productivity Commission. There's, you know, a huge range of, you know, statutory organisations set up to advise government. That's what government gets, advice, so... Yeah, uh, there are... Look, there's... We never want more bureaucracy than we need, but this is a gap. Like, this is a big, great big hole in the way that we have thought through policy and delivered services. And it's clearly a gap because what we're doing is not working. So the advice we're getting is not the right advice. So let's ask the people most affected what they think. I was lucky enough to work for many years in the Northern Territory. I lived here, but I flew up there for a week every month, and I was there when the intervention happened, and I saw the consequences. I was also there when some governments really listened and set on the pathway of doing great housing policy, and then people got impatient. So that's the feedback we, if we had a body to listen to, we'd be saying, mate, just keep going, keep listening, keep, keep doing it at a pace that meets people's needs, not this, what I call the white fellow, oh gosh, we've been doing it for 10 months and it's not working, so let's toss it out. So that's, I just see, how can we not do this? Because what we're doing is not effective. It's not working, it's wasting people's lives, it's wasting taxpayer money, and it is not bringing us together as a nation, it's giving us a, 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 a two-tier society that we should be ashamed of. Robbie, um, could I just take Susan's point? Sure. If, if to, to nail that down even further, if as decision makers it means we have to take a little extra effort to listen to the voices of the first Australians, surely that effort's worth it. Rachel, can I just ask you one, one of the questions here that we haven't covered and I, I think it's probably worth asking is, do all First Nations people support uh, the voice? Yeah. And that's, that's probably... Uh, yeah, uh, well, the easy answer to that is no, because yeah. um, not every Indigenous person supports the voice, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and that's no surprising thing, because not all Australians think exactly the same thing about exactly one issue, right? So, um, but, so what I can say, though, is that in the most comprehensive longitudinal study, so over years... Um, we consistently have, from Reconciliation Australia, who do very thorough research and wide polling, over years that there is... It, it fluctuates somewhere between 82 and 86% Indigenous support. Okay. So it's an overwhelming majority. Um, and, of course, there is also a progressive no who wants to be more ambitious at this moment. And that's fine. That's good. But the referendum is right in front of us right now. You know, it will be done in six months' time. So uh, my view, if I can put it, is that we get this piece of work done. Because to not get it done is unthinkable. Thank you.
I'll get some details about the Yes23 campaign from you in just a moment. And I, I also, if you want more tools, if you are interested, uh, if that is the, the direction that you want to go down, um, what you can do if, uh, if you'd like to, to pursue that further. Um, we asked you sort of towards the beginning of this session what your understanding of the voice was and you gave us a, uh, an instant response on that. I might throw up that same question again and get you to respond to it and get a sense of whether that uh, sense of knowledge about what the voice is and what it's meant to do has changed in the room and, uh, and online as part of this conversation because that really is, is the aim of it. So if we can throw that up at some stage... Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> That was quick, wasn't it? Uh, um, if you would like to respond to that again, and we'll just see whether we get some changes in Was that, that how it was when we first came in? Well, I... Uh, no, is it changing? It's I've, changed. That's what it is now, is it? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's what it is now. It, it hasn't so gone backwards. No, it's so gone forwards, which is... <laughs> I'm worried my confusing question about 1995 and then Marvo and then Thing and then Ford and backwards might have just confused everybody. Okay, well, there it is. We're all learning things, which is great. Probably that. Yeah, okay. Do you feel better informed after today? Hands up. Getting there. There you go. People at home going, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, we should talk about what... Uh, tools there are and what your campaign is and I, I, there are a number of different yes campaigns too yes. so we should differentiate what what is happening there but you can give us an idea of what is available to people who do want to pursue not just more knowledge about it but also perhaps get involved in some of that campaigning. Yeah so there's um, a number of groups there's the primarily the Uluru Dialogues run out of the University of New South Wales and um, there's also a group that I uh, volunteer with, Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition, AICR. Um, we began with a, a, a campaign called From the Heart and now it's morphed into the Yes Alliance. Um, so that group is, uh, has a board, which I'm co-chair of, and a non-Indigenous man, Danny Gilbert, is my co-chair. And we have a board that represents business people, um, unionists, uh, conservative politicians, progressive politicians, or well, ex-politicians, um, business people, um, people from Reconciliation Australia, uh, sporting executives, a whole range of young people, a lot of people. Um, because we believe that this is an issue that is the community's responsibility. It's not something Indigenous people have to carry on their own. It is, after all, Australia's constitution to solve, not ours alone. So we have a, a board that represents that and underneath that board is what's called a distributed model. So church groups, sporting groups, any group you can imagine we are pretty much working with. So you can sign up to be a volunteer on our website. I think the QR code will hopefully take you to our website, yes23, or hashtag yes23 for Twitter. Um, so you can sign up, you can get more information, you can be trained as a volunteer, um, you can donate, you can buy a T-shirt and become a human billboard. Um, there's a number of ways that you can get involved. But what we know is that... Um, this conversation needs to go to the Australian people. It's been in Canberra enough. It's been kicked around as a political football, point scoring endlessly between the parties. This is not about party politics. This is about Australians making a more mature nation through recognition of the deep, deep past of this country. And our constitution should reflect that. And that is the business, that's our business to resolve. So, Yes23 is a vehicle through which you can get involved in solving that unfinished business. And Robbie, I'm going to encourage people to read a book that I found really value, valuable. The, um, so, Thomas Mayo has, was involved from the uh, first conversations of the Uluru Dialogue. Uh, and his, his latest one is called Finding the Heart of the Nation. And what I love about it is, well, you're in it, uh, but it, it's talking to... It's got lots of beautiful stories, first-person stories and conversations. Uh, so that's... I just found fantastic insight from people from around the country around it. And it made me wonder, Auntie Sharon, are you happy for people to come and talk to you 
about this. I know we, we were very um, proud to have you here and you said, I really want to listen and, and hear what's said. And are you happy for us to strike up a conversation and pick your brains about it? Um, I'm not an expert on, on this and I don't believe anyone's an expert on what's about to happen. Uh, I've always been open to conversation um, about anything and any questions people want to ask. But always remember, Aboriginal people also don't have the answer to everything. Um, your, if your question is something we feel we haven't got the right answer, we'll tell you straight up, I don't know the answer at this moment, but I am going to go and talk to other people about it who are Aboriginal, who I talk to as well and find out their views as much as I can. And that's what I've been doing, actually. I've been having personal conversations with people, not so much in the mountains, um, because a lot of people in the mountains are, I suppose, they have their own opinion. I'm not going to force my opinion on anyone uh, about what's how to vote and it, to me it's about your conscience and where you come from is how you vote. If you feel that it's time that Aboriginal people have a bigger choice over their destiny then you know what you're going to vote and if you still feel you want to have it that uh, there is no other way, you don't want the constitution to in include Aboriginal people like other countries do, um, recognise their Indigenous people, then you know which way you're going to vote there as well. Where I feel personally, this is only my personal opinion, I have spoken, most of my nephews, uh, we have more boys in our family than girls, there's not that many girls, um, they... They're sitting on the fence because they're also worried that um, no one has the right to go into another mob's territory and tell them how to look after their country. That's for each nation to decide exactly how their leaders are looking after each other. And they're a little bit worried that the constitutional change might take it out of the hands of the local people on the ground dealing with all the issues that happen in Aboriginal communities across Australia. And that's coming from people in an age group, say, um, between 40 and 50. And they're, they're talking to other Indigenous people who they work with from New Zealand um, mainly to find out how their country's constitution works. And I think that's the key. And in Canada, every change will have a hiccup. Nothing is perfect. And I think when you make your vote, that's exactly what you've got to think about. You've got to think that there is nothing perfect, but sometimes something is better than nothing. And if you have something, then, dare I use the word, you can actually use that as a stepping stone for a true treaty. And that's where I'm going. All right, it's the morning after the referendum. You've been out having a sausage yesterday, you voted. The votes have all come in, there's been an announcement. Um, Mark, what do you hope it is? What do you expect the day to be? I hope that the, um, the announcement is that the people of Australia uh, voted yes. And um, I hope that uh, on that day, um, we will all stop uh, and see it as the beginning uh, of the next stage uh, of uh, a conversation and a journey towards reconciliation in this country. 
My great fear is if the country votes no, um, that uh, on that day, the hearts of the nation will be broken. So I look forward to Australia voting yes uh, and the conversation taking a new turn uh, towards a new Australia and a new truth-telling uh, and a new listening. Susan? Well, I obviously hope it's going to be yes, that, that next morning what I hope I'm thinking about is all the work we have to do as a parliament to legislate the next steps. Uh, because it will be a huge amount of work and involve a lot more conversations. So uh, that it will be, as is, as is my want to go, great, that's done, now let's get on with the real work. And Rachel. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> the, the yeah, the morning after. I mean, what do, you, what do you think it's going to be? What do you... You wake up in the morning, the announcements come through... Um, what are you expecting and what do you, what do you think that's going to mean? Well, I'll be back home in Alice Springs. Yeah. Uh, and I just can't think of another moment that's going to be as important in my lifetime as this vote. Um, if it's a no, I think we will be wounded, deeply wounded by that rejection. Um, so I'm not sure what we do after that. I think it's, um, it will be difficult times, very difficult times. So um, I don't think of that too much because um, it's, uh, it's a world which I don't want to contemplate. Um, so that's why I'm doing everything. That's why, even though my car broke down on the road to get here, I'm like, I am getting to Springwood. <laughs> Whatever happens, I want to talk to those people about how important this is um, to me and particularly to the women of my community whose voices are so infrequently heard but who are used as political footballs, our trauma paraded around and used. Um, I want them to have a voice in Parliament. I, I don't need a voice to Parliament, I want them to have a voice in Parliament. So that's why I'm here today, to make sure that that happens. And Sharon, finally. I, um, I believe it will be a yes. 100% it won't be... I don't think it'll be as close as some people think. I, I believe Australians, because of the fact that Australians today are made up of um, so many different people from other countries that have lived in some very bad conditions, they understand freedom and um, recognition. And it also would... I think they understand that the Aboriginal people of this country really need to be recognised and have a bit more of a say in the way this country's run. And that's... We might be a majority in this country, but the reality was that we were the majority once in this country. Yeah. And therefore, I think majority people quite often win in this free country, Australia. So therefore, 3% of us with another 90% of um, everyone else who's come here since 19, uh, 1770, uh, I think we've got a pretty good chance to uh, get this across the line. <laughs> Big. <laughs> uh, folks, on that note, we are going to leave it for our town hall meeting today. I want to thank you on behalf of the organisers, on behalf of Susan, do, oh, uh, Con, yeah, do you want to have a word, Colin? Yeah. Thank you. Place up here. Um, the first question was, come up on screen today, one word, how do you feel about the Uluru Statement? Me being a direct person, we weren't invited to the Uluru Statement. A few of us contacted them, got no reply. Um, we were the most decimated of all the nations in Australia. 95% of us were wiped out. Um, it goes on to say... Oh, sorry. Um, I had a, a brief encounter with a barrister many years ago on some steps outside of a 
courthouse, we just ran into each other and he asked me if I was Aboriginal and blah, blah. And so I said, yes. And he says, whatever you do, he said, every grain of sand in this country belongs to your people. Don't ever give it up. Now, I have looked, I've tried to understand this and I cannot get a, uh, a proper, um, what's the word, proper answer to it. Nothing's convinced me, and a lot of people, a lot of Aboriginal people, have said that they can't understand it either. Last night I had, I had a, uh, an email sent to me from a learned friend, a retired solicitor. I've known him for 40 odd years. I read what he, what he sent me, it was written in um, legal terms, so I sent it back and said, Can you translate it? Yeah, because it just went right, right over my head. But I still don't know what to do with the vote, okay? And a lot of Aboriginal people out there that I've spoken to say the same thing. A lot of them say, no, 97% voting for 3%. And what I can see is, who is this voice? How many is in this voice? Um, would you listen to what Bill Gates said, what's best for you in your house? No, of course not. That's how they feel they're going to be told. You know, they're going to be dictated to what's best for them by politicians and whatever else. Susan excluded. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, just since I think wants to... OK. I know what I'm told, yeah. And, and thank you, Uncle. It's just that we have the largest Aboriginal population in Australia in direct country. And we were hurt that the first hit nation wasn't at the table. And actually, those women are coming here in, in not this Monday, next Monday, seven of the Mortadula women to bring that song line back to country because our mob took the song to Uluru and they're bringing it back for us to, to dance and sing again. And what we don't want to have is be powerless because with our land council situation and our denial, complete denial of us as a nation, this is the pain that uncle was talking. And it's not about we don't think we shouldn't have a yes vote, it's just that we don't want to be damaged by the government again in a process or the rest of Australians who have the right heart and are thinking they're doing the best for us because traditional owners need and need authority in their local lands to make sure country is well, because when country's healthy, we're healthy. And land councils have the initiative to make money, where we're not for economics, we're for the ecology. And that's what we all are asking, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, the, those of you may not know about the Aboriginal Land Council legislation in, in this, in New South Wales that um, has many issues with it, um, particularly in this region. So I'm quite aware of what you're talking about there and uh, appreciate your frustration over decades with that situation. Um, it's important to note that um, not, th as I said earlier, the Uluru Statement did not have a representative from each nation. It, was, it, it couldn't do that, right? It doesn't, it didn't, we didn't have the resources or the, you know, to, to bring together that scope of representation. So it, you could, you should consider it a sample, like a sample, a representative sample, but it did not have every nation saying, this is my representative, this is, you know, this is our representative. So it has never been suggested that it does have that, um, but it just is a portion. So I think that's an accurate reflection to say it did not have a Darug representative and it should have, absolutely, but there were many other language groups that didn't also have their representative because it wasn't designed that way. Um, yes, there are concerns, as I mentioned, from Aboriginal people about the voice and what it might mean, but the principle of the voice is that it is local and regional voices. It is not how Dutton's described it, a Canberra voice. He's the Canberra voice. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. 
the principles that this has been designed on is grassroots Indigenous people from their communities having a voice. If it wasn't like that, I would not be here. You know, for too long, our nations have been ignored. What we want is a direct voice from those nations straight into Canberra. That's what the voice in intended to deliver. Um, yeah, there's more reading that you can take on it. I also say that John Corker here, who's a lawyer... Stand up, John. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very bossy, you can see that. Um, anyway, he's got the Tony McAvoy material. He's got the Solicitor General's advice about executive to government. He's got the constitutional question. He's here to be able to talk to you and ask any questions, concerns, anything you might have. He's available to you. All right, Rachel, thank you very much. And um, please thank our panel today, Mark Greenhill, Mayor of Blue Mountains, Susan Telperman, your local federal member, Rachel Perkins, Auntie Sharon Halls, thank you. Colin, Uncle Colin, thank you very much. Thank you to you in the room today for joining us, for having an inquiring mind and being a part of this process. And thank you to you, wherever you're watching via the internet as well. Um, this is going to be obviously a process that requires continued learning to continue to ask questions. The resources that you can see there are behind me are available to you straight afterwards. But um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Oh yeah. Oh, and time for some music. Yay! Yeah. 